Welcome to Kickback. Uh, it's Blue Monday. It's our third annual broadcast focusing on mental health. And we're coming to you live from Brantford, Ontario. My name is Ben. My name is Aiden. And we, this is being broadcast um, from Brantford, and we're part of the Waterloo Region channel that includes Cambridge, Guelph, Stratford, and Kitchener-Waterloo. We're very happy to also be joined by our viewers in Owen Sound and St. John's, Newfoundland for the next hour. Blue Monday is the name given to the saddest day in January. The reason we broadcast is to, is to support um, guests who are struggling with today and every day. We have lots of guests joining us in studio and in different studios across Ontario to share their stories. Some are personal stories, some are about services that organizations offer, and um, as well as self-care and coping strategies. Our first guest is the owner and co-founder of Fog Off Clothing. This brand has a powerful and meaning meaningful message that we can all relate to and they're creating awareness about mental illness and donating a portion of their sales to mental health initiatives. His startup store was started in Eastern Passage of Nova Scotia and has further expanded and most recently opened a store in Brantford's Linden Park Mall. We're pleased to welcome Tim Henberry to the show. Tim, what inspired you to start uh, Fog Off Clothing? Um, well, I just wanted to create something that um, tried to help end the stigma attached to mental health. So Definitely. I started with the play on words fog off because it's catchy and it catches your attention. Mm -hmm. um, but the fog is actually in representation of mental fog, stress, depression, anxiety, bullying, PTSD. Um, I grew up in a commercial fishing family in um, Eastern Passage, Nova Scotia. And I just, I deal with ADHD, OCD, and PTSD. And I actually always make the joke, I'm the whole alphabet. <laughs> um, and so, growing up a fisherman, in, to put into perspective of, of mental health is, you know, you're out in the fishing boat and it's a bright sunny day and you're hauling your gear and then all of a sudden you look up and you're in a bank of fog. And when you're in a bank of fog like that and your compass and your radar are out as a fisherman, you grab your phone or VHF or whatever you communicate and you call another fisherman to help you get out of that you know come find me get me out of this fog right. because you know I'm gonna I'm gonna sink I'm gonna cry you know into the reef and so in life that's mental health when people talk about brain fog or I feel foggy or the foggy situation is that when you're in that fog is to use your voice and to talk to someone call someone to help you get out of that fog and we're actually in perspective of that, of using your voice, we're actually partnered with the Kids Help Phone, where 10% of our online sales go towards Kids Help Phone. And then in general, in our stores, 10% of our profits go back to mental health initiatives locally. Um, it can be the Canadian Mental Health Association, or it can be the Autism Society, or the First Responders Society, or fire departments. Like We find different small organizations to donate the, the portions of sales to. to That's fantastic, to and you're help. keeping it local, so it's supporting the people that are directly affected. Right, so wherever the store is, that's where the <coughs> proceeds go to. And actually, for our Newfoundland viewers and Atlantic Canada viewers, we're actually really proud to be partnered with Studio, um, which is an East Coast retail chain, kind of like, um, you know, the bigger boathouse, mm -hmm. but of Atlantic Canada. They mm -hmm. have 30 stores in Atlantic Canada, and we've been partnered with them for three years. So. Um, in St. John's, Newfoundland, in the Avalon Mall, you can find Fog Off Clothing in, right. in Gander, in, in Marystown, in Cornerbrook. Um, so that, you know, the brand has expanded in Atlantic Canada over the last five years and allowed me to come to Ontario to spread the brand to, to Central Canada, hopefully across the whole country. Right. That's incredible. It sounds yeah. like you're really making the stretch across the uh, country. Yeah, it's been a lot of work, but it's my passion. And when I talk about it, a lot of people can see that, um, you know, because everybody's got a story. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have, we all have fog, you know, and we all, we're all human beings, right? And we deal with a different form of fog every day, you know, and whether you deal with mental health directly, you deal with it indirectly in some aspect of your life. So that's, you know, I use, the fog off is a, a great expression, um, you know, when you're in that state to use. And I use the clothing brand because clothing's a vessel. Um, you know, someone buys the, the hoodie or the t-shirt um, and, you know, 
in Brantford, say, and they go to California on vacation and they have their fog off shirt on. And someone's like, oh, fog off, that's pretty cool. Or like, oh, fog off, I find that offensive. Well, the fog off actually, you know, because everybody knows like with every purchase comes the brand's mission statement, like okay. the one you just read. Yeah. And so you know what the brand is. It comes on your piece of clothing. And so, you know, you're in California vacation, and someone's like, fog off. And they're like, oh, yeah, but this brand is actually in support of mental health. It's the mental fog. And so that mm -hmm. has cre created an opportunity to start a conversation about mental health somewhere else by having a piece of our clothing on. That, and that's awesome. So what, is, what does that mean to you to be able to, like, you've put out this, this brand, and it's snowballed? and you're starting these conversations and they must be happening in your stores too. Absolutely, and that's the thing about our stores. Um, when people come in, um, I try to create an environment that's really cool too, so all the walls are like live edge logs and there's Tibetan meditation music playing, very zen space. And when people come into the store, say in the mall here in Brantford, you know, the first reaction usually is like, so calm in here you know it's <laughs> like you've exited the mall and came into this end space and then you know we do festivals all over the country too um big exhibitions and things like that and travel with um campbell amusements mm -hmm. and do the fall fair tour here in ontario this year and so when you're at that festival and someone comes into our mobile retail unit is like you know they find out what the brand's about and they tell me you know i deal with anxiety or i deal with depression or you know the worst case you know in some times you hear you know my cousin killed himself or my son took his own mm -hmm. life and you know of mental mm -hmm. health and it's the last place they thought that they would be at an exhibition or in a mall and be able to talk about what's on their mind and talk about their own struggles and that's the environment that we've created um, and I mean I've I hear more stories than probably you know 10 therapists here in a whole year because yeah. every customer shares every brand supporter I hate to use the word customer mm -hmm. because of the environment because of me because I openly talk about my ADHD and OCD and PTSD that they feel comfortable talking you know and and just talking about it it, it really helps right yeah and why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the different messaging that you have on uh, sure so we have like 35 different logos yeah um, not like a lot of brands yeah. and that's a big part of my ADHD because I'm never satisfied it's yeah. just like okay that's good enough so we have different ones like this one here is uh, fight PTSD um, we have our autism logo mm -hmm. um, this is a new one for us today's forecast foggy uh, just sometimes you know it's the way you feel yeah um, this one here uh, is called lift the fog off right um, which is for me my the best medication for me is the gym um, physical health and mental health go hand in hand mm -hmm. and you know even like walking uh, running yoga any kind of form of physical health really helps lift the fog off right. like that's what I do when I go to the gym and I'm, I'm you know lifting weights is totally clearing my mind and getting in a better state of mind to go on with the day that's right. a great vis visualization as well when you're out doing your physical exercise and you think about the things that you're struggling with and if you're able to visualize using that exercise to force them off or absolutely and it's I encourage it so much you know even if you just go to the gym and get on an exercise bike or mm -hmm. there's days I pull in I go try to go seven days a week um, and it's you know somewhat of an addiction but it's a medication so uh, there's days I pull into the gym and I'm like oh, I can't like who likes the gym really but <laughs> you go in you do it and when you leave it's like you kick the doors off the place and it's like okay come on world right you know it's just when you push yourself to do that physical activity it, it's you feel better mentally physically and it's just a good focal um, perspective on the day when you leave, it's like, okay, I accomplished that, so now let's take on what today has to in store. Right. And so w with that, too, there's so many different ways that people um, clear clear the fog with the, the struggles that they're dealing with. Um, so there's so many different ways. So for yourself, it's the gym. For others, it might be meditation. Mm -hmm. um, so just being, like, people just need to try. Absolutely. Um, if they're struggling, just try and find what works try for them. Try and find what works for them. A, diff a release yeah. right mm -hmm. to because you know anyone who's dealt with anxiety or depression is like it's a it's a crappy place to be you know and mm -hmm. and sometimes you just feel like there's no escape and you to really push yourself even to go out of the house some days can be a real struggle but once you 
find that strength or you know use your voice and tell someone what you're going through and that friend comes over and is like okay come on let's go you're going outside we're just going for a drive we're going just to kind of break that fog and lift that fog right is that what if somebody is um, struggling and they're not really sure what to do or who to go to what would be uh, some advice that you might give them you know I find and this is my own perspective on things because right. like, there's a lot of people who you know will go to a therapist mm-hmm. and then talk about things like that I think it's best personally to find help groups of people who struggle with the same thing as you because mm-hmm. you know when you go and talk to a therapist about anxiety number one that therapist is not going to tell you if they deal with anxiety or if they've dealt with depression mm-hmm. they're going to be a therapist mm-hmm. um, so it's you kind of stand offish for that person with anxiety to talk to somebody who doesn't have anxiety or deal with anxiety and get advice from them right. whereas talking to someone with things and just like oh, I know exactly what you're going through it's an easier conversation to start and to have and there are you know online there are lots and lots of support groups for people with anxiety with depression with you know survivors uh, or you know people who have lost uh, loved ones to suicide Um, you know the same as cancer uh, the same as PTSD which is really you know a forefront um, topic now with our first responders, right. yeah. you know, with paramedics, with doctors, with police, with firefighters, with those people who do it every single day. You know, our military, um, when they're deployed and they deal with it uh, overseas and then come back. Um, but our first responders, that's their job every single day. You know, whenever you hear sirens on a fire truck or an ambulance or a police car, it's never a good situation, mm-hmm. you know? And, and what they see, a lot of people couldn't even fathom seeing it once and then you see it repeatedly and so now that those organizations are recognizing with first responders that this is the outcome of their job Mm -hmm. that you know therapy and some treatment and (coughs) different ways to help them are coming in the spotlight I think it's it's a really great thing and that's what our brand um, has done you know our our clientele for our demographic people say you know it's like what is your demographic and it's like it's everyone mm-hmm. and there's no clothing brand out there like that you know um, different retail stores in the mall it's like okay well that's for you know teens and this is for women and this is for you know older generation right our message is for everybody right and that's why we have a, so many different logos like our pink heart logos for breast cancer like I said the autism one PTSD um, I have an ADHD one as well I had it on earlier but I yeah. wore my main logo this yeah. is the one I started with five years ago in the East Coast um, and I'm sure you guys caught what the F is yeah. in, <laughs> and fog off you guys try to figure that one out and to where what is your like uh, website where uh, it's fogoffclothing.com yep and our social media handle is at fogoffclothing for Instagram and Facebook Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks today. for having me. And, we really uh, appreciate, I really your appreciate uh, you helping me get my message out. Yeah. Yeah. Fog off, everyone. Um, so thank you so much, Tim. We really appreciate it. Coming up next, Aiden had a chance to chat with Steve Seftel, the author of Shattered Ice. He's a former Washington Capitol who is now sharing his story of depression and journey to the NHL. Welcome to Kickback. I'm joined by Steve Seftel. Um, Steve, thank you for joining us. Um, let's talk a little bit about your book and about uh, your history playing hockey. Sure. Uh, I'm a Kitchener native. Uh, I played all my minor hockey in Kitchener, including the uh, Kitchener Bauer Krauts back in the day with Coach Murray Freed and then midget for the Kitchener Green Shirts. I was drafted by the Kingston Canadians in 1985, 31st overall, the third round. Played three years in Kingston. Uh, In 1986, I was drafted in the second round, 40th overall, by the Washington Capitals. And uh, after my three years in Kingston, I turned professional. Had a brief stint with the Binghamton Whalers of the American Hockey League just to get used to the pro pro game. And then I uh, went on 
full uh, full on in 1988 89 with the Baltimore Skipjacks and uh, an American Hockey League and then I played my first NHL game in Detroit in 1991 at the Joe Louis Arena against the Red Wings so um, yeah hockey was it was a great I uh, enjoyed it and it was um, a great experience and something uh, you certainly don't forget definitely now your book uh talks a little bit about um, some struggles that you had while you were playing hockey and you didn't quite realize it until two years ago, you are saying. Um, so tell us a little bit about the uh, struggles that you faced playing hockey and how it came to be that you found out that you were struggling. Yeah, interestingly is, and I think it's important to know, I didn't understand what I was dealing with and I wasn't diagnosed until two years ago with a mental illness. Mm -hmm. Leading up to that point, uh, until about age 49, I just thought this was who I was and something I had to personally deal with, mm -hmm. just to have a character trait. And uh, but my first time I was aware of it was at age 16. I was in Czechoslovakia for a, a hockey tournament, and um, I got stuck in an elevator and had my first panic attack. And it's something I'll never forget, that's for sure. Yeah. And uh, What was that experience like for you? It was uh, frightening. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things with panic attacks is you think you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I've learned through this, uh, through my therapy, is that even though your brain's telling you that, you're not in actual danger, mm -hmm. but your brain convinces you of that. And it, uh, so, you, you know, I've learned that through cognitive behavior therapy, jumping way ahead. Yeah. But at that time, yeah, I was a full on panic attack. I thought I was in significant trouble. Moving on to Kingston and Junior, it's tough moving away from home when you're 17. Definitely. Um, I went through some of that, that adjustment, you know, being a little bit homesick right off the hop, but still the hockey drives you, you know, that's your dream. So mm -hmm. you kind of, you move, you move in the hockey, with the hockey because that's why you're there and you kind of bury everything else. I signed a contract with the Capitals in 1986 and that really was the, started to add a little bit more pressure. I would call it a self-induced pressure cooker where mm -hmm. you're just, you feel like you're always under the microscope. Everybody's there's always somebody watching you and you're trying to prove yourself and you know get to the next level. Uh, I suffered through that again just internally on my own and didn't tell anybody about it. Then turned professional um, during my pro years. Again mental health was not something we talked about at any time I was struggling. I just dealt with it internally. I didn't share it with anybody. I didn't feel like I could share it with anybody and that there was no one really talking about it at that time. So that all just added up and added up and that cumulative effect took till about age 49 when I had a complete breakdown. Mm -hmm. Having that breakdown, um, that was kind of your inspiration to write your book, Shattered Ice. Um, so tell us how the beginning of the book kind of began? Well, I went to see a psychotherapist when I was in a real bad place mentally after uh, in a February of 2018. That's when I had my complete crash. Couldn't get out of bed, didn't want to get out of bed. And I went to see a psychotherapist. And one thing she told me that uh, really sh impacted me is she said, you've been suppressing this for decades. And she said, inside your body you have shelves and you can put, every time you suffer a trauma, you put this glass jar on a shelf. Mm -hmm. And she said, you've, you suffer trauma, put your shell, uh, glass jars up. And she said, eventually you run out of space for those glass jars and then when that happens, everything crashes to the, gr to the floor mm -hmm. and smashes. And she said, you either implode, which is hurt yourself, you explode, you hurt others, or you get sick, and in my case, I got sick. So some of those old hockey injuries in my knees, shoulders, groins started to become inflamed. I had, uh, it seemed like just spent sponta spontaneous uh, swelling that made it impossible for me to get out of bed and to get I couldn't get out around the house without crutches. So I started writing the book because I was home alone and uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. My head was kind of um, spiraling. My mm -hmm. thoughts were going and racing in a lot of different directions. And the book became an opportunity to focus myself and kind of throw myself into that ac activity full speed. So I had uh, something to put my focus my time on. Yeah. Did you find it tough looking back at kind of your life and the, everything that you were through at that point? Or? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, I did. And the initially when I wrote my book, it was dark, and I sent it to my editor, and she read the first go round, and she, her comment back to me was, "Is this the book you want to write? Because it's pretty dark and." Uh, she just wanted to make sure that was the road I wanted to go down. So I read it again, and I realized that that wasn't really the story I wanted to tell. So mm -hmm. this, the, the book is a combination. Shattered Ice is a combination of my hockey journey from age seven and the joy from the sport. Mm -hmm. But the, I tell it in the present moment, and therefore you come on the journey with me. And so the mental health is in there, and mm -hmm. I tell it in the present moments. So you're going to experience those struggles with me on the journey but it, I also want to make sure I give credit and paint the picture that hockey was the joy in my life that kind of kept For me sure. grounded and the mental health was there and I lived with it but it was the hockey was special. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important for athletes like yourself to be able to speak about their struggles especially hockey where it's kind of like if you have an injury shake it off get back on the ice go after it again it's very aggressive sport and you don't really see the uh, emotional side of it and you're not allowed to express that side yeah i'd agree and uh, the culture in hockey is one of toughness and uh, doing whatever it takes to win i mean that's part of competitive sports i guess and um, especially the physical sports like hockey and football um, you have to play like a warrior and you you really aren't given any avenues to discuss the way you're feeling mentally and what we're really good at is compartmentalizing so mm -hmm. we are trained from a young age to focus on the game that's coming up. Then when the game starts, focus on your next shift, focus on the next period, focus on the third period. Then the game ends and then you start that process over. Okay, let's focus on what we, who we play tomorrow. Yeah. And there's no real uh, coaching on how do I deal with what I'm feeling along the way mm -hmm. as mentally. Now, I'm going back to when I played. I think that's changing slowly, but there was no avenues for it when I played and it made it really difficult. So what happens is you go home and you're alone with those thoughts, those destructive thoughts you're alone with by yourself, you know, in your bedroom, mm -hmm. or you're going down roads. Guys, uh, that's when you can become susceptible to things like drugs and alcohol, that's self-medicating. Um, gambling, there's all kinds of vices that kind of provide some temporary relief when you're struggling internally. For sure. And I think also there's kind of the view of the way that everyone else perceives you they think that because you're an athlete that you don't have those problems and if you're aggressive on the ice you need to be an aggressive person off the ice or you need to kind of play your role as the person you are throughout your whole life not just when you're doing the sport so um following through and drinking excessively or whatever and having a good time that's what that kind of was back in the 90s when you were playing that's a great point uh People do see you as a, an athlete, or a, and many kids and many fans look up to you as a, a sporting hero, if you want to say. For sure. And again, you start to see yourself in that way, and you don't want to be seen as weak. So when I think of Michael Landsberg, his sick, not weak, uh, it's such a great uh, hashtag and, and idea to promote. And I remember going along the road of my hockey journey, I always thought being mentally ill made me weak. I never thought of myself as sick. I mm -hmm. thought I was weak. So I would suppress all that to portray that that personality that you were just mentioning of being the, the big tough hockey player. Mm -hmm. And you start to see yourself that way and you can't see yourself as weak. So when I heard Michael Landsberg say the opposite, no, you are sick, you're not weak. And it's okay to talk about that. It really struck me. And I got on the and kind of jumped on his bandwagon, or if you want to call it that, where I wanted to promote that as well, as I knew I had a platform as an ex-hockey player, and I wanted to carry that message too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you do uh, coaching for um, a couple different teams. Um, do you share that with the uh, teams that you coach and kind of talk about the mental health side of it? I do. I mean, I'm coaching 11-year-olds last season, mm -hmm. um, so they're a little, they're young boys. Um, you got to they still need to have fun. I guess that's the big thing. Absolutely. So if there's one thing I do try to do, it's to not get them too worked up about one single game. Exactly. Because there's just a lot of games ahead, 
And when you're 11, you should still be loving the sport. And I think that's one of the things mental health, my, for me, my mental illness, over time dealing with that internal pressure cooker starts to suck the life out of you and, and the love of hockey. Mm -hmm. So with my young 11-year-old players, my biggest goal is to make sure they're always having fun, whether it's in games and practices, coming together as a group. Still have fun. You got to have fun coming to the rink because if you're not, mm -hmm. you're not going to stay with it. And we want, I want them to keep playing yeah. as long as they can and enjoy the game. So you were saying um, earlier before we started recording about uh, meeting with your social worker and kind of that's how you began um, and uh, with a naturopath as well. So um, why don't you tell me a little bit about that and kind of the direction that that took you? Yeah, I was in a crisis situation when I had my breakdown um, in February of 18. So they immediately sent me to a social worker and she's the one that turned me on to Michael Landsberg. I watched his video and then I watched another video from TED Talks about panic attacks. And it was the first time I had heard anyone ever verbalize a panic attack. I'd always only played that out in my head. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard another human being say the describe it so it was for me it was jaw dropping I shared that with my wife and my mother and my family and then from there I went to a psych uh, a psychotherapist who helped me kind of get my get all the pain out I would say mm -hmm. and then I went to a psychiatrist I also went to my family practitioner so he put me on a medication which certainly made a difference in the way I felt day to day for sure. that helped a lot and then I would lastly I went to uh, a naturopath and he helped get my nutrition and stomach in order and I can't that was really big too so using that holistic method was the I use those all those different methods and services available and I went and found the help and using all of them together is what turned me around and it took about a year and then the writing of the book writing shattered ice was the last piece where again being home alone having a lot of time it didn't happen overnight like it was a slow process mm -hmm. It took several months, but so I still needed to be uh, have something to do to keep myself busy and be productive. Absolutely. So that's what the book did, and I turned the book into a full-time job. I would do it nine to five many days while my wife was at work. That's amazing. Yeah, um, you mentioned cognitive behavior therapy, and that's one thing that I absolutely love. Um, I've used it for myself, but tell me a little bit about how you use that for yourself. Yeah, what's important with mental illness too, with, with me, with uh, so OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, that leads mm. to anxiety. And then my anxiety leads to the most frightening form of anxiety, which is panic attacks. And sure. that's the, you know, then you're, once you've reached that point, you're almost um, sometimes debilitating or inconsolable. There's just, but as far as the cognitive behavior therapy goes, what I learned there, is you learn to recognize the uh, the triggers that cause you to get into those situations. So mm -hmm. if I have a trigger that causes me to start to feel anxious and eventually could lead in the past would have led to a panic attack, I can snuff that f little fire out, yeah. I guess I would say. So before it gets me into that complete desperation stage. So you recognize it. And I guess the best way I was explained to me is you've got your, I'll call it a beast or a trigger, and you've got it in the room with, with you, and you recognize it's there, you don't deny it. You have to recognize it's there, mm -hmm. and then allow yourself to continue in a, a calm state, as calm as you can be, and tr eventually that will pass, and then you can continue on with whatever you're uh, doing, hopefully, but you don't let it get you to that that worst state which for me is panic and then you're then you just you know, you're in trouble and that's what leads you into those uh crisis situations for sure thank you so much steve for joining us um tell us where we can find your book shattered ice is available on amazon.ca in canada um it's also available on amazon.com us locally i have it at several uh, outlets wordsworth and waterloo looking for heroes and Kitchener, uh, Green Heron Books in Stratford, or Green Heron Books in Paris, mm -hmm. Fanfare in Stratford, Coles in Stratford, Merrifield in Woodstock, and Zenfire in St. Mary's. So the local merchants I'm trying to support, and uh, it's been a real positive uh, experience for me.
That was a great interview, Aiden. Thank you, Ben, and thank you to Steve Seftel for sharing his story with us. Uh, animals can have a big effect on our mental health. They can cheer up, cheer us up, and they can also help us heal from traumatic events. We're now joined by Alika Degui um, from Big Heart Equestrian. Yep. Um, so tell us a little bit about your work there. So we partner people with horses usually um, and the horses reflect back what emotional state you're in so it's really cool to watch the people ask well why is this horse pawing at the ground or grabbing the rope and whipping it around and it's, it's interesting sorry to say well what are you feeling and we dig that up a bit and they maybe say well I'm anxious or this horse is making me really really nervous I don't know what to do so it's the horse projecting back what you're feeling and that's all just based on the science of it so your heart rate's increased you're fidgeting you're sweating maybe so the horse sees all these signs and says something's wrong we need to go we need to run <laughs> and so they're showing that through pawing at the ground or pulling a rope out of your hand or acting silly <laughs> <laughs> so did you always have a like a love of horses yes and all animals, animals. i yep. have snake from snakes to horses we have it all at my house <laughs> so <laughs> animals are kind of my thing Nice. And yeah. what inspired you to start Big Heart Equestrian? So Big Heart Equestrian started as um, like horseback rider education. So to try to make equestrians more gentle with their animals. Um, and then my partner, he's an Afghanistan veteran. So when we started talking about what his um, rehab kind of looked like coming back from Afghanistan, I was extremely disappointed to see that there was really nothing. And his biggest thing that he would always say is, I don't want to sit in a room with someone who doesn't know what they're talking about and I'm going to tell them my trauma. Right. And I said, well, that's fair. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do that either. Yeah. So I, him and I kind of brainstormed on how we can help um, more people and especially the veterans that are suffering in silence, per se. Um, and we decided that horses have an effect on him specifically and he knew this is something that could be beneficial to everyone so we put together the program for vets and it took us a long time to launch it because I was really nervous um, but last year we launched it and it's been super successful what's beneficial to this kind of program is we're not talking about the past in any way if mm -hmm. you feel the need to confide in us we're totally there for you but that's not our job we're not going to unpack your trauma and make you all sad we're going to help you learn skills for the future so coping mechanisms um, identification strategies so understanding what's going on with yourself mm -hmm. and how to move forward from that so so what would be some examples of how that would be shown um, so for me my one horse phil uh, <laughs> he's very aggressive with me he's super gentle with everyone else but me he's like you can handle it you, you got stuff to work on. <laughs> so he's uh, ripped my clothes before, like ripped jackets, um, left pretty big bites on me. <laughs> um, and that's all when I'm going to the barn and I'm super anxious and on the verge of tears. He's like, don't come near me like this. I don't mm -hmm. want to deal with you. <laughs> yeah. um, but other people, it shows as the horse is completely ignoring them. So we'll be out in the field and I'll say to someone, well, go see what horse is calling to you and all of them run away so it's really interesting to see them go I'm not breathing and I'm like well yeah that's what you know animals do when they're being hunted the the predator won't breathe right they're holding their breath they're anxious to attack so the horses think you're a predator and are running from you so maybe try breathing and go forward and you always watch the people kind of put it together think about how they can help themselves get to the horse and in turn, you're helping the horse anyways, so, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, it's gotta be intimidating for some people. Like, a horse is by no means a small animal. No. Like, <laughs> well no. over a thousand pounds, I can imagine. Yeah, so my horse, Phil, his real name is Big Phil because he's massive. He's like, if we sit on either side of him, we couldn't see each other over his shoulders because he's just so big. Um, and for him to be, for me to tell stories of him being so aggressive with me, people obviously are gonna be terrified of him. And then they see him and he's this cuddly giant to everyone but me. So it's <laughs> it's super cool how they work. That must be really neat to see, like when you say, okay, now go see which horse is calling your name. Mm -hmm. To see, because I'm sure you have all different, like very 
ages of horses, sizes yeah. of horses. Yeah, so we have, um, my partner Kevin just purchased a horse last year. He's only two, like mm -hmm. he'll be two in April. So he's a baby. And then we've got, you know, a horse that's in her 20s. So we've got a vast array of personalities and ages and sizes and breeds. We have minis, they're like the size of a golden retriever. So <laughs> it's really cute to see who kind of calls to who and, and how you're feeling that day depends 100% on what horse is gonna want to work with you. Right, and so now when somebody comes to you and they're, they're working with you, is it like they get paired up kind of with one horse or is it they might, depending on, like you just said, depending on what they're feeling, mm -hmm. they get to interact with all of them? So uh, a lot of the time it very much depends on, on the day and our goals. So I have some teenager clients who really need to learn how to, you know, set boundaries for themselves and I'll pair them with Phil, for example, because he's good at boundary setting. So if he doesn't want to do something, <laughs> there's no way you're getting him to do it. Yeah. So it's it teaches you know the young people that you don't always have to do what everyone tells you to do mm -hmm. within reason, right. obviously. Um, and then there's you know times when moms come to me as clients and and Rena our old mare she's very motherly she just wants to help everybody <laughs> she ends up just walking right up to the ladies and it's like she just knows she just so knows. it's super cool now you've expanded into uh, doing first responder treatment as well so how did you decide to go down that route so in the industry I'll say um, veterans and first responders are very much kind of uh, grouped together because of the things that they've seen and right. the things they've experienced are so on a different level than the average person, I'll say. Um, so when we were doing veteran stuff, I said, well, this could be really beneficial to first responders. And an organization that my partner and I work closely with is called Helping Heroes Heal. Mm -hmm. They agreed with that as well. So we kind of branched out and met a few first responders and they're just super cool people. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they work so well with the horses that it just, it felt like it had to be that way. Like it just had to happen. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. And when I think about uh, like this uh, type of I guess therapy or modality of treatment. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily like horseback riding. No, we don't do any riding at all actually. Mm -hmm. So because my horses are so allowed to express whatever they want to express, it'd be super dangerous to throw people on them and be like, okay, have fun. See <laughs> because, what they're feeling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hold on. Yeah. Um, because they're just gonna react based on how they feel they need to. So. Mm -hmm. Um, the only time anyone really gets to ride is when they've been in, in the program for a while and they can recognize, you know, okay, I need to get down or I need to walk away. Um, otherwise, it's just a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so how can somebody uh, get in touch with you? Uh, Facebook, I would say, is our best bet. Pretty much all of the team has access to Facebook, so if I can't answer right away, someone can answer you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just Big Heart Equestrian. Awesome, that's mm -hmm. fantastic. And as far as what can somebody expect when they first come out to work with you? Um, I always tell people look for my white car <laughs> and park near there and then I'll meet them out and then we walk into the barn. We kind of do a tour of the facility. Mm -hmm. So it's very um, transparent. I want everyone to feel comfortable. So you get to see the whole place, you get to see all the horses, you get a feel for their personalities. If someone's super nervous, we'll probably work with the minis first because they're small. <laughs> Uh, but they are mighty, so don't let their size fool you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then go from there. So it's basically everything that proceeds is based on the person and how they want to proceed. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know we've talked before about it, how sometimes it's even uh, being sent out to the barn to feed yeah. the horses, right? Yeah. So that's actually one of my activities that I ask people to do is I give the more experienced people a bucket of food and I say okay either go into a stall with one of the horses or go outside with them and just listen to how they're chewing so it takes you out of your mind and all that anxiety and into the real physical world so it's a mindfulness practice and they don't even know what's happening so it's super cool that's amazing yeah so where is your uh, barn located we're just in Caledonia so it's about 30 minutes from here that's awesome mm -hmm. Not too far at all. No, oh, easy drive for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so now you also have, um, are there any other services? I'm drawing a blank. I believe there is something. Yeah, so yeah. we also offer aromatherapy and we do programming with dogs as well. So we started incorporating my wiener dogs into the program. So they help with mindfulness classes. Um, we do life coaching classes with more group style, so it's more mm -hmm. accessible to people. And I always 
brain the dogs. They're kind of a decompression tool, if you want to call them that. <laughs> <laughs> and when you bring, like when you're working with these animals, how, do, how does that work for you? Because animals are definitely very much their own, like to have them trained yeah. and willing to work. And yeah, so it, it, again, it goes back to me and how I'm feeling that day. So um, sometimes I teach at a special needs school. So if I'm there with the dogs, I have to be mindful and aware and out of my brain and in the real world to make sure that my dog is going to sit when I ask him to and take the treat gently when I ask him to because my dogs are still puppies too. So they do really well, but they're still young. So I have to be very mindful and aware of what's going on. Definitely. Mm -hmm. That's really neat that you're able to use puppies because I think that gives a whole different sense of yeah, like people need to be more aware of that. So mm -hmm. that's really neat. Yeah, because they, they want to run around <laughs> like crazy little monsters. They want to run everywhere. Um, so it's important for me to tell people, you know, like be aware of how you're feeling. If you're super excited, they're going to be crazy. So we want to be super chill and relaxed, and the dogs are probably going to fall asleep if we are. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a nice way, the same as the horses, right, mm -hmm. to kind of mirror what's going on yeah. with the individuals around them. Yeah, dogs are a little different because instead of reacting based on that predator or prey sort of um, dynamic, mm -hmm. they they learn from their people. So my one dog has learned my anxiety. Like it's bad, but we're working on it. He picks up the second I'm anxious and just mirrors every single thing that I'm doing. So if I'm pacing, he's pacing next to me. He's running like, around the table. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> Jax, just go sit down, dude. It's fine. It's so interesting. So awesome. uh, what ages did you deal with for? Um, the youngest I've had out to the farm was four, and that was for behavioral concerns. They didn't know mm -hmm. how to express their emotion mm. uh, in a healthy manner. Um, but anywhere, any age really can benefit from it. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. so, and what does it mean for you to be a part of uh, like an initiative like Kickback to continue to spread that it's important to just chat and talk and be open with what you're feeling? Yeah, I think it's important um, for people to watch things like this for many reasons to know like you're not alone like I have anxiety I'm sure everyone who's coming today has some form of anxiety it's fairly normal um, and that there's so many different ways to get help a lot of people mm -hmm. think that you know you're gonna go see a therapist and that's it and then you're gonna be on meds and that's it and that's just the only path to take but really if you're not comfortable with those things there's so many different routes like there's naturopathic doctors and mm -hmm. different kinds of therapy and yoga and meditation all these different things to try and I don't think people realize that until they watch something like this. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Elika. We really appreciate it. Mm. And we appreciate everybody watching at home as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, coming up, we will be joined by Jill Ferris to discuss emotional resiliency. But first, a former uh, Gulf Storm player started his own charity that focuses on youth and their mental health. So actually, um, we were sitting in the Sleeman Center in the off season, just talking about ways to improve the community programs um, for the storm, Gulf Storm. And uh, Garrett mentioned that he had always wanted to do something on his own, and he would want to want to do something with mental health. So that conversation in April of 2016 um, evolved into a September 2016 launch of the McFadden's Movement. So Garrett started out um, talking to minor hockey teams and then it went to minor sports teams because girls soccer teams and volleyball teams wanted to get involved. Um, and he basically goes and he talks about his story and his introduction to mental health, which was the loss of a close family friend when he was in grade uh, nine. And then he talks about all the challenges and obstacles he's faced throughout his career on and off the ice. Um, I think he's basically seen it all. Um, so he tries to connect with kids and make a connection and make mental health something that they could talk about. I think the younger that you understand that it's okay to talk about those things, the easier it is as you get into those bigger challenges. Um, I think the saying is um, when you're young, it's little problems and when you're big, it's bigger problems. So I think if you learn those coping mechanisms and learn how to talk about those things when you're younger, it'll be easier to talk about when you're 16, 17, 18, 19, even when you're 20, 30, however old, um, and you don't get set in ways of 
of not being able to talk about when you're struggling. Welcome back. We're now joined by Jill Ferris. Jill, thank you so much for joining us. Jill Ferris is a emotional resilience coach, um, as well as is with uh, Moto Yoga Brampton, and she's also a paramedic in Peel Region. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I, I'm so excited because I've been curious about this since I, I saw it pop up on uh, the run sheet. Can yep. you can you tell us a little bit about um, EFT? Absolutely. So EFT, commonly known as tapping, mm -hmm. or um, EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Technique. It's been around since about the 70s, and it's a combination of psychology and acupressure, or traditional Chinese medicine. So what we do is we create a dialogue about how we feel, mm -hmm. and then with that dialogue, working with your practitioner, you tap along the meridian points that are identified through traditional Chinese medicine, and you just tap. And the idea is, is that all emotions have an energetic foundation, mm -hmm. right? So you can talk and talk and talk as much as you want about how you feel, but if you're not actually talking to the body and the nervous system you're not actually releasing that energy that you're feeling mm -hmm. it's kind of just staying stuck right I use the analogy of remember those pinball machines we used to play as kids yeah. and you would pull the trigger back and the ball would go and the lights would go off and all the levers would move that sometimes that's what my body felt like for eight months right I had an eight month long anxiety attack and it mm -hmm. didn't matter what I did as far as cognitive techniques to deal with my anxiety it helped me connect a lot of cognitive dots, mm -hmm. but it didn't help me feel any better. Right. And then when I discovered tapping and I could use this dialogue as well as talking to my energy body, oh my gosh, like stuff started to move and I was like, wow, you know, there's something more. And then I just dove down that rabbit hole and, and the rest is history. So how did you find EFT? It's something that I've never even really heard of before. It's not that popular. It's slowly gaining popularity and momentum, um, but honestly, it came across my email. One day I subscribed to a, um, a network, a mental health um, energy network, and it said um, tapping for anxiety. And I was probably four months into my anxiety mm -hmm. attack at that point, and I was, I'll, I'll try, right? I was just at the point where I was like, I need something here. And it, you know, luck would have it, the universe brought it to me, and I tried, it was a very, um, a very generic sort of tapping meditation, um, but I did it, and I was like, wow. Like I'd never experienced that sort of release before or that shift. And I was like, okay, I need to know more. Right. So then I just got Googling and I got YouTubing and was doing more tapping meditations. Um, and that helped and I was feeling better and I'm like, okay, there's something to this. And then I felt like I needed somebody to work with me on my stuff. So I, um, again, I Googled, mm -hmm. um, you know, EFT, um, and I found a practitioner in my area, Susan, my teacher, coach, and we worked together and it was just, it was a match made in heaven. Like the stuff that you are able to move when you work one-on-one -on -one with a, an EFT accredited practitioner, mm -hmm. um, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing what you uh, release and the clarity that you have around your stuff. It's so fantastic. Awesome. And yeah. what would you suggest for somebody that maybe uh, is like, oh, you know what, I would love to try. Is that just the same thing as you, like go on YouTube, Google? There's tons of free stuff on YouTube, yeah. absolutely. Um, and they're great and they're helpful. And I think everybody will get to a point where they'll be like, I need to work on my stuff. Like I need to really focus on what I'm feeling and what I've experienced. Yeah. And that's fantastic, right? It's like counseling. We all need our person. Um, if you are going to work with an EFT practitioner, make sure that they are accredited. Mm -hmm. um, EFT International is one of the big accrediting bodies um, because a lot of things do come up and you need to know that you are safe in the environment that you're working with and you need to know that that practitioner is not going to leave your body and you in a point of crisis mm -hmm. because that's not why we go for help. Right. I don't go to feel worse. There are you know waves you're going to go through as you do this work and that is normal because it's normal to have really really good feelings and it's normal to have really not so good right. feelings but we don't want to get stuck in the peaks and we don't want to get stuck in the valleys so you've got to work with somebody um, that can hold that space and that knows the techniques well enough to be able to bring you back to that place of okay I'm good right. yeah so it sounds like 
balance is a huge thing for you Absolutely. throughout all of this. It Absolutely. sounds like balance, and I imagine that comes from yoga. So did you get into yoga first or EFT first? No, I got into yoga first. Awesome. I got into yoga first because I had a back injury from work, um, and that, that fix that managed my back injury. But as you start to explore the yoga, you know, philosophies, traditions, experiences, it's all about balance, mm -hmm. right? Traditional Chinese medicine, the yin and the yang, it's about balance. You don't want to have too much of one thing and you don't want to have too little of the other. And then, yeah, exactly, yoga taught me all about balance. And then the more I explored yoga, the more I learned about Ayurveda, which is the sister science of yoga. And Ayurveda says anything can be medicine and anything can be poison. Right? So you don't want to have too much of one thing. You need to constantly be balancing. Right? And that is what the beauty of EFT does because the EFT works at the body and says, okay, I'm up here right now and how can I use this technique to release what I'm feeling and to bring me back down into the state where I can be calm and I can be focused and make rational, organized thoughts and have rational, organized conversation and not be, you know, whoa, up and down all the time, having to, you know, manigate, or mitigate that pinball machine that, you know, we sometimes live in. Right, and I'm sure the, the breath work that you've learned through yoga as well has mm -hmm. been an incredible tool mm -hmm. um, to be yeah. able to use. Absolutely, yeah. the science of breathing. Right. You know, I say, I say to my students, um, who taught you how to tie your shoes? You know, and they'll say, oh, my mom did, you know, and uh, who was your grade three teacher? And they'll say, oh, Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. And they say, who taught you how to breathe? And they all have this, like, blank stare on their face. And it's like, yeah, you know, some breathing is very automatic. It's very built into our, our body and our nervous system. And as soon as we're birthed from our mom, we just start breathing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't learn to breathe until I was 30. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn to breathe until I was 30. Um, and when you understand the science of breathing and utilizing that long, slow exhale to stimulate that vagal tone, right, that 10th cranial nerve that we have, um, you can really send these calming signals to the body, to the heart, and then the heart rate just slows down, and then the body calms down, and you don't get into that sympathetic fight or flight response where you're like, oh, I'm just like, I can't think, and you freeze, right. right? I mean, we all have that, it's built and it happens, but to be able to recognize it and then do something to just balance yourself on your own, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. so unbelievably empowering. I think that once you're able to recognize your breath, then you become a lot more aware of everything going on um, as far as how you're feeling and yeah. even like if you feel your temperature start to rise, mm -hmm. things like that, it all comes back to your breath. I Absolutely. Find. Yeah. Yeah. And most people will say, you know, take deep breaths. And that's good to a point. <laughs> but when you overdo those deep breaths or now we're in that cycle of, you know, that sympathetic response and we're getting a little too up and a little too agitated. So it's really those nice, slow, calm breaths. It's the exhale. That's where the that's where the goodness is. <laughs> yeah. And for, for EFT, so for the mm -hmm. tapping, mm -hmm. is that something that, at what state, is that for, like everybody has stress in their lives, mm -hmm. would that be, is it for anybody? Anybody and anything, mm -hmm. right? My kids know how to tap. Mm -hmm. I tap on my kids all the time. They can tap on them. Um, there is no, there is no person that it is not beneficial for, right. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, you can use it on anything, right? You can use it on anxiety, on depression, fears, phobias, eating disorders. PTSD is a really, really big one mm -hmm. because we know that trauma doesn't live up here. Trauma lives in the body. And the cool thing about tapping is it's a body-centered technique. And mm -hmm. you're tapping on the nervous system of the body, which is what trauma is affecting, essentially. So right. anybody can do it. Awesome, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, and somebody that might be maybe on the fence about trying mm -hmm. uh, something like that, because it's a, it's a different strategy, right? Absolutely, and, it's and it looks kind of weird. Yeah, it yeah. looks kind of so, weird. Uh, for somebody to, to go and try that, mm -hmm. um, what would you suggest to them or give some advice to them? So, try online first, right? Because we're all really comfortable doing things in our home when no one else is looking at us, mm -hmm. judging us. So just find a, a you know, a video online, um, YouTube, Google, whatever, and just try it. And the most important thing with tapping, there is a dialogue to it, mm -hmm. but you really need to drop into your body and feel what you're feeling because the tapping is working on the feelings. So stay with that uncomfortable, that negative emotion and tap and breathe. You need the breath to move it, right? Breath is energy and right. what you're feeling is energy. So you need the breath to move what you're feeling, those nice slow breaths, and then just tap and tap and tap until, you know, you feel better. I think that's really neat that you say 
stay with that feeling because even though it's uncomfortable, a lot of people want to avoid those negative feelings, but Absolutely. it's really Absolutely. important. to. And that's why people run away from them, because you get stuck in that heightened sense of, oh my God, oh my gosh, or you get stuck in that like low, slow, that depressive sorrow and grief, and it feels really uncomfortable to be there, and you almost feel like a victim to it. Right. But the cool thing about the tool of tapping is that you are empowered to be able to shift your own stuff. So you just stay with the feeling and trust in the tool and breathe, and you will start to feel the body shift you will and you really build up that emotional resiliency absolutely absolutely right. and how important is emotional resiliency in like our day-to-days I think it's the thing mm -hmm. right we like you said we all have stress and we need to be we all want to show up as our best selves as mm -hmm. our best best authentic selves but when there's those you know imaginary um, sandbags or weights on your back and you just feel so bogged down by your stuff you're not as likely to show up to your job or to your relationship or to your kids as you want to mm -hmm. because you just feel this load that you're carrying. You know, so why, why wouldn't we want to do what we can absolutely do to release some of that stuff to say, this is Jill and this is who I am. Right. And that is, you know, this is what my gift is to offer to you. I think that's just, I think that's what we all want to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. How long does a typical, uh, session of EFT tape? Last. Um, you know, I, I was tapping actually outside before I came in and I yeah. just simple like tapping on my karate chop and just breathing. Um, but if you're working with a practitioner, typically a session is 45 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. We generally don't want to tap for longer than an hour because when there are some big emotions that do move, it's quite draining on your body. You know, if you've ever, um, you know, had sort of some big energetic release if you've ever gone for like a reiki session and there's been a lot of energy that the practitioner has moved there's sort of a little bit of a there can be an energy hangover sometimes um, which is normal totally normal just need to you know get some good rest and drink and hydrate and um, the more tapping that you do sort of the more accustomed your body is to moving that energy and i mean i i don't feel like that way anymore after my very first session oh i i I felt pretty drained, um, but yeah, 45 minutes to an hour is a, is a typical session. That's awesome, yeah. so you can take any amount of time, but 45 minutes Absolutely. if you're going Absolutely. to a professional. Yep. Yep. Thank you so much for joining You're us, welcome. Joe. You're welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we're going to say goodbye to our viewers in St. John's, but everyone else, please stay with us. Coming up, Greg Horton and Ryan Kitchen will be joined by more guests here in our Brantford studio. is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Queer people were usually not the ones at the forefront of crafting these narratives. It's not about me, it's about what I represent. What, what, what is this lesbian thing you speak of? You can't put two men together. Uh, you can do that. Are they? Are they? They are! People stood up and said, this show is meaningful to me and here's why. 